Um, so uh, Kevin goes on to talk about you know cre creativity um, here, uh, and um, you know just that the Christian might have a little bit of a different view when when we view nature, um, just in terms of um, you know the understanding that, that that things aren't random, you know. So uh, I, I'm not sure what it would be like to have you know if if, if you did have a perspective that everything's, you know, random. You know, I've never really had that perspective, so I, I don't know, you know, how, how, how you would, maybe somebody could, could share how, how maybe you would look at that. I think it's one of the things that, uh, you, when you hear, when you hear uh, creationists and people, intelligent design folks talking about this, you'll, you'll hear them say that, you know, even the scientists who consider themselves atheists have to borrow our worldview in order to do their own science. Because our worldview holds that there is a consistency and that there's a God who maintains that consistency in how he created. So they're using our presuppositions in order to do their own science. It's, it's a, they, may, they may proclaim randomness but they don't actually believe it in practice. They can't, because they've never planted a tomato seed and, and grew corn. Right. 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 Or a monkey. Yeah. Or a monkey. Right. So, good. So, um, you know, with, we, it, if we know that there's there's a designer and a creator, we can understand that you know the design for for everything is intentional, purposeful, um, and and as humans created in God's image, um, we can we can look to creation um, to and, and see potential solutions for problems. Um, is is the concept for us as students? But then I think one of the context here is this is. Somehow, as teachers, we would want to uh, convey this this honor and, and this this mystery to, to our students. Um, so, um, let's see. I think that Kevin goes on to um, kind of explain to us how how we may be able to to get this across to our students. You know, in in, in terms of um, the, the the honor and, and the nobility of, of our learning, um, and uh, he he gives the example um, of uh, George Washington Carver, um, and uh, I think I uh, I don't know if I have time to re read this whole quote, but uh, I'm sure most of you guys are familiar with with him. Um, I think Joel's talked about him before. What would you have to say about about him? Any, any comments? I, I don't think I have too many heroes, but he's, he's definitely one of them. Uh, he, he, he wanted to know things. He learned to read by, he found a, a, a speller on the property of the Moses Carver who adopted him. He found a speller and taught himself to read. He wanted to know things, and when he started his science, he, um, they didn't have any, hardly any equipment, so he went out and he scavenged stuff. He just wanted to know. And so, of course, nowadays you can't know unless you have all the right equipment. Well, he, he, he wanted to know first, and he found the right equipment. He made the right equipment because he really did want to know. He's a, he's a hero. Right, so as, as we go through this list, I'm just trying to think, how, how could I convey this to, to my students? So, you know, we would... Um, Try to convey that you know knowledge is accessible. I mean, we we can learn things. We, if, if maybe if one of one of my kids has an interest in something, we can give them resources to encourage them to hey you know pursue this, seek seek this out, um, research this. You know, um, uh, number two, um, you know if if it is true that there is an intention and purpose behind creation, um, you know that means that we. We, we can discover this, you know, we have the capability to discover this. Um, if anybody has any ideas how we can, you know, just in this context, you know, like ways that you've conveyed this to your students or anybody you've mentored, yeah, go ahead. 
I think this is what you're talking about. I know. I think one of the big ways my dad did it was if anybody who ever knows him real well knows that he will always tell you about the book that he's reading at the moment. He's always like super excited about it. So he will, if you get into a conversation, you know, have someone over for dinner, the conversation always would go eventually to the book he was currently reading and he would, all the interesting things he was learning. And so I think that rubbed off. And just that excitement about learning stuff really rubs off on us children. Yeah, I think there's some, somewhere in here, maybe I'll read it later, but just, you know, the more excited the teacher is about the subject, um, that, that kind of, you know, the, the students will, will, will get a lot more out of it, you know, as opposed to just somebody just reading from a book and, you know, just punching the clock kind of thing. So. <laughs> Very excited about algebra and our kids. <laughs> well, we're talking about general principles. <laughs> So, so um, an another thing to, uh, in terms of how we approach this is, you know, in terms of, um, since there's significance and meaning in creation, um, just to understand that there's usefulness in all things. Um, and he says the work of discovery is the work of obedience here. Um, and then um, if we believe God did create the world with order, um, meaning and purpose, then uh, we, that, that, that should produce in us you know, a, a wonder about the world that confronts us. So, um, uh, point about that, Jeremiah. Yeah. Perhaps the, the greatest thing that we can teach our kids is, is that wonder and curiosity. It's to instill in them a curiosity about the world around them might not be the same interest that we have. You know, I, I was unsuccessful in creating a curiosity about algebra. But they're curious about other things. And if, if we can make them curious, then we can't stop them from learning. Yeah, that would bring up the subject of rabbit trails. With our kids, I found that I'm trying to teach something. You know, I have my list, you know. And then this question comes up that apparently is a rabbit trail, and my tendency would be to shut that down because uh, you know I have an agenda. But um, I've read different places and been advised that those rabbit trails that can actually that can be like the the pathway that our kids are actually interested in. So, what do you think? Should we shut down those rabbit trails, or should we just let them go, or what would you you know? Depends on what the rabbit trail is. Yeah. Well, likely it's what our kids are feeling a sense of wonder about, but it might not feel on our agenda for the day. It may not, and it may not be the time or place to follow that rabbit trail, but it's something to keep in mind to come back to. And one of the joys of homeschooling is that you can follow rabbit trails, at least to some extent. All right. So, uh, a couple more here. Um, because of this significance and meaning, um, th th there is um, you know, honor um, found in the work of discovery. Um, so Kevin just points out that you know, the one who chooses the work of a scientist, theologian, doctor, engineer, statesman, is engaging in a worthy occupation. And uh, it, it elevates it to the, the, the concept of calling, you know, in terms of uh, calling of honorable men and women to discover truth hidden by God and in his work and world. Um, and um, you know, it just has the verse here, you know, whatever your hands find to do, do, do it with all your strength. So I, I don't know, I, I don't know if I do a great job with this. Um, I'm certainly challenged by, by this um, to, to be able to pass this off to our students, but um, feel like sometimes I'm so busy, um, you know, with my checklist that uh, I, I don't do a great job with this. So this is certainly a challenge to me. You guys have any other comments or advice for busy teachers uh, before I move on to the next one?
All right. Um, so uh, let's see the next one here. Um, uh, I almost thought that this one might kind of go without saying, but um, as I you know, read, read through this, uh, certainly uh, was wor worthy of, of spending time, obviously. Uh, just to be, we should be building on the right foundation. And uh, I guess part of the reason why, you know, I said, you know, I don't know if we need to go over. I mean, our, our church is, is such a solid church as far as, I mean, that's what we do, right? We try to, we're intentional here about laying right foundations and, you know, between, you know, our worship service and Sunday school and Mars, I mean, that's kind of what we're all about, you know. Hopefully, I, I, I guess that's the vision. Um, but um, it's just good to be reminded here in the context of, of education um, that this is also what we want to be doing, you know, in our homes and in any, any setting where we're trying to teach or educate. Um, so um, yeah, Kevin's intro, intro to this is just, just the... Um, I guess the uh, the lawsuit or, or, or the the struggle over you know creation versus evolution in the school, you know with with um, you know Clarence, Clarence Darrow and the William William Jennings Bryan, um, just as you know uh, you know just the the conflict that, that took place there, and then uh, he um, he says there are a few battles as intense as those fought over education. Uh, there, there are two reasons for this. The first reason is that the stakes are very high. Powerful interests compete over the direction set for the next generation. It is the battle for the minds and the souls of millions of children. It is the battle of ideas. So uh, he says here that um, you know the pen's always been mightier than the sword because the pen produces powerful ideas that directs the minds and destinies of men. And that its education is in the business of communicating these ideas, and that you know this is this is its its major purpose is to communicate these ideas. And uh, just a little side note: I remember uh, hearing a talk by Jeff Bakken one time, and talking about conversations with your kids. I guess last time we talked about or a couple of times, you know, paving the roads and, and having conversations with your, with your children as far as building relationships, and you know. I remember Jeff saying, you know, well, what do you, sometimes, what, what do you talk about with your kids? I mean, sometimes, you know, you spend a lot of time with them, you know, and he, he, he advocated just talking about ideas. Um, so, um, that's what we need to be doing here. Um, so, we talk about foundations. Um, he, uh, Kevin would, you know, he's always bringing us back to the Proverbs here. Um, and uh, we've been talking the past couple Sundays just in terms of the, the fear of the Lord as the beginning of knowledge. Um, and so, so in terms of how this, this applies to, uh, to, to school or to, to education, um, you know, we would, we would think about what, what would constitute a good science class. Or, you know, like if we're teaching science to our children, um, you know, how... How can we, you know, have have the fear of God, you know, fear of the Lord in the science classroom? And, um, you know, Kevin just points out that, um, uh, you know, he says, what what would constitute a good science class? Uh, you know, for example, you know, picture the instructor describing the order, the beauty, the complexity, the expanse, and the glory of the universe, the human body, and the animal kingdom. Then he lifts his arms and whispers to the class. Silence for a moment. All of you, stand in awe of him. Stand in awe of him. Let us worship the mighty creator of heaven and earth. Anything short of this is not good science. So, something we can think about when, uh, again, my, my busyness of trying to get through certain things. You know, hey, let's get through this page. You know, let's, let's get through this lesson here. Um, just a good reminder for me to um, bring things back to the creator and Do you guys have any thoughts on that or comments? I just love that comment. You know, without, without standing in awe of Christ, with all our science, we, we haven't gotten to the point yet at all. And uh, I wasn't going to say it, but I, I, would, 
I was on, last night I was on the computer, and this this tiny ant um, got on my computer, and I just watched it. And and this this ant, it looked like it had purpose. It looked like it knew what it was doing. It was it was a, it was an amazing thing. And I know from reading, ants can do hundreds of different functions. Like I don't know the size of that ant's brain. It's got to be like microscopic. Who could, who could create an ant? Who could possibly create an ant? And I, I, I just felt like that ant really glorifies Christ, or glorifies God. Because no one can create an ant. Not, not with a brain that small. I mean, I, I, does it even have a brain? I don't even know. I, I guess it does. Well, of course, God tells us to go to the ant. Oh, yeah. Wise, so. <laughs> Sounds like that's what you're doing. I guess it has brain. You didn't say go to the tip. Um, <laughs> it's, but to this, it, you're, you're talking about world view here, which is the previous point, but it's kind of the same point with the, the ideas and the fear of the Lord. If you don't have the right world view, you're not going to get anywhere with your science or your history or any of your studies that's going to be of any lasting value has to has to conform to the word of God. And that's something that we just we don't press enough. On. Right, so that um, kind of what you're saying here is the next slide. Uh, you know, it goes on to talk a little bit about these different areas of education, but stick with science for a minute. Um, you know, he, he does talk about the fact that there are two, two different kinds of science, let's say. And i uh, got to see if I can find this uh, quote, but kind of like what you just said, John, that, um, you know, he, he points out, our, our, heart, our lives have hardly been improved by the work of Charles Darwin. I thought that was... Uh, an interesting thing to think about. You know, that, that that would be the case. I mean, there's so much said about him, but you know, has, has he really improved our lives? But um, you know, he, he that, and then he goes on to talk about other scientists like you know Isaac Newton. I didn't I didn't know that he was a uh, apparently a Christian. Uh, but you know, he says that he's the father of modern physics, and he wrote, "There is one God, the Father, everlasting, omnipresent, almighty." maker of heaven and earth, one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. So um, just pointing out that you know, uh, scientists with more of a Christian worldview have um, contributed much more to, to our world than scientists with the wrong, wrong worldview. Um, so uh, let's see. Other areas of uh, education where he, he uh, Kevin's making um, some distinctions here. Um, here is in, in the area of um, communication and um, speaking. You know, we we talked about you know uh, um, focusing on the basics a couple times ago in terms of how communication is one of the basics of education, and um, he uh, he points out here. Um, as far as um, you know, Greek classical education versus what he would call biblical. We touched on this last time a little bit, but it says the basic constituent of a good education represents the sharpest. This basic constituent of a good education represents the sharpest difference between the Greek classical form and biblical form. And he talks about um, Aristotle's book Rhetoric, which I've never read, but I've heard of. And he says, uh, in his 300-page tome, Rhetoric, Aristotle somehow forgot, the, forgot to mention meekness among his virtues of courage, justice, wealth, and beauty. Yet compare that to Peter's three-line treatise on Rhetoric in 1 Peter 3, 15 through 16, where he slams home the importance of engaging in rhetoric with meekness and fear. Meekness before men and fear of God. These are radically different theories of education. So, um, just uh, 
continuing to think about, you know, when we are so much curriculum out there and, and different, you know, ways to teach our children and just for us to uh, be, uh, to be un understanding of, of, of these different views and to um, be discerning, I, I guess, in how we, you know, communicate and, and teach, teach our children. So, you guys have any other examples of, of different worldviews or, or different uh, competing uh, ways to teach before we move on to the final uh, principle? All right, so the final uh, secret here um, is the principle of why sequential progression. So, um, in terms of education, obviously, uh, we can't teach a child everything at the same time. And um, you know, what makes something complex is the combination of multiple concepts, laws, and facts at one time. Um, so, because we talked about the principle of individuality recently, um, you, you know, I'm sure, uh, I don't know about everybody in the room, but we, it's kind of tough to identify which grades our kids, you know, or what grades our, our kids are in, just because they're all kind of at a different place, you know, in, in different times. Um, but but that, that doesn't mean that, you know, a, he says, you know, a, a child of 15 is not going to be studying what he studied when he was five. So, so there is some concept that, you know, in our education there, there needs to be, um, you know, some kind of progression. Uh, you know, a Y sequential progression um, going on. And um, in, in the beginning of this chapter, uh, he just has this section that says, by the turn of the 20th century, America was emerging as the greatest nation in the world by almost any measure. Wealth, freedom, innovation, or military strength. There are reasons for this. In fact, there is something in the history of this country's educational system that is worthy, that is worthy of note. The mere fact that education stood as a high priority in the minds of the Puritans, the sons and grandsons of the Reformation, provided strength to the nation in its infancy. So, I was thinking of your comment last time, John, in terms of we were talking about you know, life application and not getting too, um, you know, the the importance of learning, you know, life skills, you know, in terms of having balance, but um, just the encouragement that you know, the Puritans, who I'm sure most of us would think highly of, they, they did place a high value on, on education and, and schools. So, and, and Kevin points out that that was um, one of the reasons for uh, America's emergence as you know, the greatest nation in the world. So, so there does, we do want to take this seriously. Uh, is, is the point. So as we take this seriously, I think, you know, the, the final principle here is just how do we progress, you know, through these things um, in a wise, sequential way. So. Quick comment. This is a, uh, there's a passage in the book that Joel referenced a couple weeks ago called Understood Betsy. It's a book that was written in the 20s. It's a children's book, and it's a story of a, a girl who was um, orphaned and had lived with an aunt in Chicago for her first like eight years. And then the aunt couldn't take care of her in Chicago and she moved to a farm in Vermont or New Hampshire or someplace that looks like that. And, and so she moved from a public school setting where she went grades one, two, three to a single room schoolhouse in the rural, rural setting. And she was very insulted that she was uh, given a second grade math book by the teacher to work on and said, you know, well, I'm a third grader. And the teacher said to her, yes, but your, your math skills are only at the second grade level. Yes, you're a third grader, but you're reading a fifth grade reader. What you need to do is master each one as you go. And so the idea of sequential progression is the idea of mastery as you go. It was a very different concept when I first read that book years ago uh, of getting out of that K through 12 mentality saying, okay, you're a third grade, you should be studying this, 
Now, it's a matter of mastering it as you go and you do it wisely. Parents are in the best position to know how their children progress. Just a comment, I highly recommend the book. Understood Betsy. Understood Betsy. Dorothy Canfield is the author. Okay. Yeah, so thinking of that mastery and, and only progressing um, to the next level, when you've mastered the, the, the first level, I've um, been reading some things recently um, and, and that, that, that would say that if you, I guess this is kind of obvious, but you know, there are certain things like if you move on to the next level without mastering that level below, it can, it can actually really you know, hurt you. Um, and and not, not not only in in obvious areas like math, right? I mean, if you try to move on in math, you know you're going to be frustrated. But even like um, basic things like char character, you know, like if you don't take the time, you know, to if, if our children don't develop certain characters when they're you know younger, but then you know they're continuing to progress, you know, in different areas. Uh, obviously, that's gonna that's gonna have a negative impact. So it's, it's kind of obvious when, when, when you say it in front of, you know, a group of people. But um, I think, that I, I know for, for us, I think we've, you know, just because we're trying to stick with that K through 12 concept, you know, you, you feel this pressure to keep progressing, you know, because maybe you feel like you're failing as a, as a teacher or, you know, um, but, but maybe we just need to slow down and learn some of these lessons um, a little more thoroughly, maybe, so. Any more comments on that before we move on? Try to stop me. It's the, the same. It's the same idea of leading a horse to water and not making a drink. Is that you? We we need not be so concerned about our children being at a particular level. They will eventually get there. You can take them to the water. If they're not ready for it, they aren't going to drink it. But when they're ready for it, you can't stop them from drinking from that water. And that's that's where we go with our education, is that we're putting those opportunities in front of them, we're making sure that they master things before they move on, and then you just kind of get out of their way. You're, you're not teaching them as much as giving them an opportunity to learn. It's a difference. So that, that sometimes that takes patience. <laughs> Huge patience. Which, I think I'm patient in some areas of my life, but some other areas I'm very impatient. So I, that's a lifelong, uh, I think, character quality to learn, I think. I don't know. All right, well, I'm thankful for the questions because uh, I, I didn't have a huge amount. I, was, I knew we had a lot to cover in a short amount of time, so I'd try to keep things simple here. Um, so as far as the stages of learning, I mean, there are... Uh, like I said, I've, I've been reading this this one resource um, recently. There and, and the resource it's it's called Thomas Jefferson Education. If anybody wants to Google it, I, it's, it's been fascinating to learn some of some of these uh, principles. But there, there's major, you know, well-known, you know, psychologists over the years that have um, come up with all these different ideas of stages, you know, of learning. You know, there's, there's, there's many different you could, read, you could get whole books on, on different stages, you know, theories of, of all this. But Kev, Kevin just kind of breaks it down. This is Kevin's concept here. Um, you know, three different stages. Knowledge. So stage one would be knowledge. Uh, stage two would be understanding. Stage three would be wisdom. And he, um, biblically, he um, draws out some, some different verses to demonstrate this. So, for, you know, in terms of step one, our children would need to learn knowledge. So... Uh, he, he writes this passage here in Psalms. Um, then step two, once our, our students have a certain amount of knowledge, but, but then you need to under, have understanding. And he, he points out the uh, verse in Hebrews. And then step three, um, uh, ideally all, all of us need wisdom. Um, you know, and, and then he, he draws out the passage there in First Peter. Um, so he expands on this a little bit, um, uh, just uh, pointing out that um, your knowledge is picked up by the senses, and it's the memorization and storage of facts. So um, most of the, any of us that have done any reading on education, you know, a lot of there's a lot of 
advocating, you know, that kids can memorize things well. They're, they're really good at memorizing. So that's, when they're young, that's kind of the time to, um, they can memorize the capitals and, you know, um, Bible verses and um, their, their math facts, you know, the multiplication tables, like that's the time to teach that. Know, as a first step, um, but then uh, we then we need understanding. Then, um, and Kevin points out that understanding is discernment, which is would be the the arrangement of those facts that they memorized. You know, on, in step one, and then um, and then of course we need you know wisdom is good decisions, um, expert counsel, practical or technical skill. So he um, builds on this a little bit. Um, here, so stage one, you know, a child is taught first principles, rules of grammar. We already talked about this. Um, and it's only when a child is able to apply these principles to the changing situations in the world around him uh, that he achieves maturity. So, any comments on stage one here? Yeah, I, I was kind of wondered that myself. I mean, I would probably just think the first principles of, of any subject, like, you know, um, geography or, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's grammar or first principles in, in all different subjects. So, um, so then stage two, um, you know, this is where we would, you know, our students would uh, um, start to connect the principles and relate relate um, the principles to facts, um, you know, in terms of framing arguments against, you know, opposing worldviews. Um, I was a little discouraged that this is stage two, because I don't know if I, I don't know if I can do all these things. So, um, you know, if my students are supposed to be able to do these things, uh, I have a little work to do. Um, uh, attribute the fall of the Soviet Union, you know, in terms of understanding history. Um, uh, I think I could do number three pretty good. Um, you know, thanks to Jonathan Park. I mean, seriously. I mean, it's actually, you could actually talk. You guys all know who Jonathan Park is? I mean, it's, you could, it's actually, I don't know, do you, it, you guys know? It's like, um, so it's like, a, what do you call it? Like audio drama of like this, like explorer. There's like this explorer society. I guess it's like Adventures in Odyssey. Kinda. But but there's a big like push towards like, um, you know, like there's themes, like these, these, these audio dramas have like themes. And the big theme of Jonathan Park is like uh, creation versus evolution. But it's actually an interesting, uh, I mean that's just a, is a good example of like um, teaching. Like, you know, like somebody could explain like, you know, the reason why there's dead animals in, in rock layers like in a dry lecture. Um, and I might not really, you know, remember. I might leave and, you know, but like, here in these, as I'm in Jonathan Park episodes, you know, it, it's a great way to teach, you know, so um, it's kind of informative, you know, I, I found myself thinking, man, they should have, you know, they should do, you know, different, you know, dramas on history, you know, and, and you know, um, literature, I mean, it's just the effective teaching method, you know, is what I'm saying. Um, do you guys know of any other uh, audio dramas out there that, like, besides Adventures in Odyssey that you've listen to that have been helpful in terms of teaching or dramas. Yeah, have you already of them? Yeah. They're more character. Right. It's more like um, fiction you know, stories. Is it Torchlight? Is it no, no. Yeah, Torchlighters. I think that we've had that's like uh, there's a lot of them around that missionaries I think. Yeah, I think it's more missionary stories. So yeah, that's, that's definitely an effective way to teach. Um, so yeah, that's stage two. And then, uh, you know, stage three, um, the final stage is you know, found in, you know, applying these principles. Um, and Kevin just points out that this is important, especially in the teenage years, because, um, you know, he says one, you know, one reason is because, you know, a 12 year old must somehow be prepared for life by the time he's about 18. So that's kind of where we're at, 11, 12, with our oldest kids. So, um, you know, it, it, the reason why he needs to be able to apply these things is, you know, he, he's going to need to 
you know, sell his products, uh, argue his position, uh, make a reasonable de defense of his faith, um, apply his math and you know his business, and um, you know have a budget and, and just exercise leadership. So um, you know, so uh, let's see. Um, <clears throat> So the, the passage in First Peter that um, Kevin uh, referenced, um, he, it, it calls for the ability to give a, an answer to every man, which, which means every kind of person. Um, and so um, another element of this is that our, our students, uh, you know, they, they, as they grow, they're going to need more varied experiences in which to operate. Um, and um, he just talks about, you know, the homeschool child who has been raised in the shelter of a home should now have some opportunity to exchange ideas with a wider range of people, including, you know, those with more or less education uh, and also those with different cultures, backgrounds, and levels of maturity. So um, I think Kevin's, you know, a couple different times he's, met, he's mentioned the importance of our children um, as they're ready being... Um, Exposed, you know, get, or get given opportunities to, um, I guess, you know, put what they've learned in, in the practice. Um, so I, I know here at the church we're, we're big on um, trying to stay out of the ivory tower concept of, you know, um, just learning a lot of head knowledge but not being able to um, put this into practice. And uh, I go ahead. And I read an essay some years ago about a technique and it falls along these lines where uh, a student uh, converted himself from an average C student to uh, passing everything like straight A's by a technique he called teaching to the wall where he actually practiced his lesson as if he was teaching it to somebody and all he would do is just turn to a wall and, and teach to that wall as if he had a class in front of him. And if he couldn't teach it, he didn't know it. And then he would go back and study the parts that he couldn't teach. So he just kind of made notes about his lesson, whether, whether it was English or math or, or science, didn't matter. And he would turn, he would teach it to the wall out loud because at least for him, that's, that was the technique that worked. And he taught it to the wall and and he never failed or never didn't ace another test by teaching to the wall. And that's the same idea of practice of practicing. It's being able to address all these things out loud. It doesn't give you an argument back, but it's it's part of <laughs> being ready to I'm scratching my head. <laughs> All right, so uh, in conclusion and to review, I thought this was a good way to review uh, here. Just, um, I'm big on check. Can you guys all read that? I didn't even see uh, it. Well, I, I, I like checklists, so um, th you know, this certainly could be a way to review what we've learned, but also give us a way to evaluate, you know, potential curriculum, you know, as, it, as this year's winding down, next year's coming up, um, you know, so uh, you can read through this, you know, does this choice, you know, sufficiently integrate character building? Yes or no? Um, you guys can, you guys can read through the list. I mean, can you guys, is there any, I guess at this point we could just, you know, wrap up here the, the set, this, this, um, the series and just ask if you guys have any questions or if this, if list lists um, reminds you of any anything that you heard over these few weeks that struck you uh, as, as interesting or you wanted to comment on here as we wrap up.
Well, I guess, uh, I mean, some of these things would apply. I mean, we think about curriculum, right? Like, you know, we would, maybe we would all be thinking about curriculum for next year. Or, I mean, some of these things, you know, um, would, would apply. I mean, if you have two or three different science curriculums you're trying to choose from, I mean, I, I, I guess most of these questions would, would help us to, um, you know, maybe it'd be a mixture of class, the classroom, you know, textbook kind of stuff, but then maybe if there's, you know, experiments or, or there's opportunities to, to do life integration or, or you know, any of these other elements, so. Well, yeah, well, thanks for uh, hearing me out here through, through this uh, study. And uh, just in, in conclusion, um, I, this just came across my email recently. I think I can pull it up. Um, you guys might think I'm like a, a soapbox for Kevin Swanson or something here, but uh, I think if I go like this. Ke Kevin just sent an email. I don't know if anybody is on his email, uh, e email list, but I guess they're, they're having this. Um, he's putting on this like curriculum, like I guess he calls it like a summit. Like a curriculum summit here. That's not going to work. Well, anyway, I'll just mention it. If you go on generations.org, I think it is, um, they're having this, um, you know, they're bringing in like 25 curriculum experts. May, May 3rd through 10th, I guess they're going to do like an online, like a webinar kind of thing where you can like sign in and. Um, but some of the speakers that I recognize, like uh, Ken Ham, um, uh, Kevin Swanson, and Andrew Pudwa from the Excellence in Writing. Uh, I guess he's pretty well known as a writing guy, you know, communication, you know. Um, have you guys ever heard of him, Andrew Pudwa? Yeah. Um, and uh, Mark Hamby from uh, Lamplighter. He's going to be part of this, you know, interaction. So, uh, yeah, just some people that I've heard of and respect. So, it'd be a good resource for all of us to sign, sign in. Well, so I guess Kevin's website is generations.org, I believe. And so, if you go on there, you'd be able to sign up and get access to that. So. Yeah, well, thanks for uh, participating. <laughs>